So we're going to do an example now using the beam stiffness matrix to analyze a simple problem. Uh, the problem we're going to be looking at is we're going to have a beam that is six meters long. And the ends of the beam are going to be completely fixed in or on cast ray. And let's dimension the beam. That's going to be six meters. But for the dimensioning, I'm going to say three meters to the middle, three meters to the middle, because I'm going to add to this a point load right in the middle of the beam. The point load is going to be F, and we're going to define some real data in a minute. So to solve this problem using the direct stiffness method, we need to set up the element stiffnesses, and we then need to set up the global set of equations, and then identify some of our knowns in the system before solving. So before we continue, let's give ourselves some data. So. We're going to say that F equals 10 kilonewtons, and we're going to say that the EI of the beam equals 5 times 10 to the 6 newton meters squared. We have all the data we need. Um, now, to be able to analyze this problem, we're actually going to have to model this because we want to apply a point load in the middle, we're going to have to model this with two beam elements, each of three meters long. And let's number the nodes, node one, node two, node three. And the elements are doing a different color. I'm going to be element number one and element number two. For this situation, we're using the same EI value for each of the beams. So we only need one element stiffness matrix. And we're going to recall what but the element stiffness matrix. So K KE was equal to EI. I was constant multiplier on all of the terms. And there were lots of terms in this matrix. We're only going to reproduce a few here. So we had a 12 over L cubed. So L in this case is not the length six meters for the entire structure. It's the length of the single element. So L would be equal to three. And I'm just going to write that down next to our other data. So we had 12 over L, L squared. L cubed 6 over L squared minus 12 over L cubed, etc. Okay, so that's the elements difference matrix, and that would be the same for both of the elements. So, what I'm going to do is go directly to assembling the two elements together. So, having a look at our structure. We have transverse displacement and a rotation at node 1, transverse displacement at node 2 and a rotation at node 2, transverse displacement at 3 and a rotation at 3. So we have, in total, six degrees of freedom in the system. So we're going to draw the full system equations. First thing I'm going to do is the pre-multiplier EI. We have numerical data for that, but I'm not going to use it just at this moment. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six columns, one, two, three, four, five, That's where I can cheat by rubbing out. So one, two, three, four, five, six rows. 
And now we're going to identify the degrees of freedom. So we have, let's call it V for the vertical displacement. So V1, theta 1, V2, theta 2, V3, theta 3. And that would be equal to the six external forces or moments. So I'm going to call that F1, T1, F2, T2, T2 is the moment T2, F3, T3. And that's an, all in a big column vector. So I'm just to change this color for a second. So for my first element now I have degrees of freedom v1 theta 1 v2 theta 2 and for my second element I have v2 theta 2 v3 theta 3 so element number one will all occupy these four by four matrix we're inside the global stiffness matrix so that would be 12 over l cubed 6 over l squared minus 12 over l cubed 6 over l squared uh, 6 over l squared 4 upon l minus 6 upon l squared 2 upon L minus 12 upon L squared minus 6 upon L squared and I'm going to leave the central ones out for a second and we have 6 upon L squared and 2 upon L and then we have the 4 components here that overlap with the second element, which has degrees of freedom V2, theta 2, V3, theta 3. So I'm going to highlight where the second element fits in the global stiffness matrix. And again, this element, I'm not going to draw all of the components then, would have a 4 upon L, a minus 6 upon L squared, but come from the standard stiffness matrix for the beam element. Um, for completeness, let's, so 2 upon L, 6 upon L squared, minus 12 upon L cubed, minus 6 upon L squared, 12 upon L cubed, 2 upon L, oops, sorry, 12 upon L cubed, that one's wrong, minus 6 upon L squared, and we've got 2 upon L, 6 upon L squared, minus 12 upon L cubed, and minus 6 upon L squared. And now, in these middle sections, and I'm going to draw, use a different color to highlight, we need to add the components from beam element number 1 to the components for beam element 2. So the first component here would have a 12 upon L cubed from element 1, and a 12 upon L cubed from element 2, and that would then give us 24 upon L cubed in the 3 by 3 slot in the global stiffness matrix. Similarly, we have 4 upon L from element 1 and a 4 upon L from element 2. Give us 8 upon L in, the, in this slot here. And similarly, we're going to end up instead of minus 6 upon L squared, we're adding 2 of those together, we're going to get minus 12 upon L squared and minus 12 upon L squared in the opposite diagonal. And this then leaves us, as a part of this process, it's going to leave us zeros in the matrix elements where none of the stiffness matrices are adding together. So 
we have a full set of global equations that we need to solve. So in theory, we could need to solve for six degrees of freedom in this problem. And we could change the boundary conditions or whatever, and the number of degrees of freedom we need to solve would change. So let's have a look at the boundary conditions we've defined here. And let's write down what we know about this system. So looking at this, we know that V1 must be equal to zero because we're fixed in the y direction. And we also know, because it's fully fixed, that theta one must be equal to zero. There's no rotation at node number one. And the same, again, goes for V2. Must be equal to zero. And theta, sorry, V3 and theta three must also equal to zero. At node two now, in the center, we have an unknown V2. There's no way we can solve that. And for this particular problem, where we have symmetry of the boundary conditions and symmetry of the geometry, where we get extremely lucky, we can actually say that we know that theta two must be equal to zero. So from doing a qualitative analysis, that's saying is our deflected shape. That's not the best drawing ever, but our deflected shape there would look like this with no rotation at the ends. And also from symmetry, there's no rotation in the center. So we're going to use that data now. And so we know we're going to get to our reduced system of equations. We're going to use that data we've just defined now. Um, let's find a nice pen for that. So our unknown degree of freedom u1 or v1 is equal to zero. So we know that this whole row and this whole column no longer need to be considered in this solution phase. Okay, we also know that theta one is equal to zero, so we can we don't need to solve for theta one. So again, the whole row for theta one and the whole column for theta one no longer need to be considered. We don't know V2, so we cannot remove that from our solution. However, we do know from symmetry theta two is equal to zero. And we also know from the boundary conditions, V3 equals zero and theta three equals zero. So five out of the six rows and columns have been deleted from the system. So we can now get to our reduced system Reduced system of equations where in this case, due to the boundary conditions and the symmetry, we're left with just one known, which leaves us with not a matrix to solve, but actually a scale equation. So rewriting that slightly neater than that might be useful. So E I 24 over L cubed moved by U2 equals minus 10. So we're going to solve this equation in terms of u2 and we're going to leave the l cubes and the ei's in there. u2 is equal then to the minus 10 multiplied by the l cube from the bottom divided by 24 ahead of myself 24EI, and we'll underline that answer. So our unknown degree of freedom, the single one we had in this system, has been solved for. So we're going to carry on now once we know this unknown displacement at U2. So this is this displacement at the central node there. We're going to use that 
and use the same method as we've done for truss elements, bar elements, to solve for the reaction forces and the internal forces. So, the reaction forces. And the procedure is identical to what we did with truss elements. So we need, if we want the reaction, the vertical reaction at node one, then we need to use the first row of the global assembled stiffness system to solve for the right hand side force F1. And so from that row one, again, all of the other deg degrees of freedom are zero, so we can reduce this down very quickly and very simply. We're going to get that minus 12 upon L cubed multiplied by EI multiplied by U2 is equal to the right hand side which was equal to F1. So now we're going to substitute the value for U2 that we just recorded. So F1 is equal to the minus 12 upon EI divided by L cubed coefficient multiplied by u2 which was minus 10 l cubed divided by 24 ei and you can see the l cubes cancel out the ei cancels out and you'll get finally after rearranging you'll get but f1 equals five kilonewtons and it's positive so pointing upwards and from symmetry you could very quickly say rather than using the the fifth row of the system of equations we can very quickly say that f3 is equal to f1 so now the next thing that we'd want to calculate is the moment at node 1 yeah, the moment at node 1, so that now is the second row of our system of equations. And again, we, the 6 over L squared is going to multiply by V1, which we know is 0. The 4 upon L is going to multiply by V1, which is, we know is 0, etc., etc. So we're going to very quickly reduce the equations down. So... From row 2, we're going to get that T1 is equal to minus 6 upon EI divided by L squared multiplied by the value of U2, the only non-zero degree of freedom in the system. So T1 equals minus 6 EI upon L squared multiplied by u2 minus 10 l cubed divided by 24 ei and again we can see that ei's cancel out some of the l's cancel out so we can reduce that down to 60 upon 24 l which equals 5L upon 2, which equals 7.5 kilonewton meters, and going in the positive anti-clockwise direction. And same as for the vertical reactions, we can also see straight away that the moment reactions are going to be symmetrical, so T1 equals T3, which equals the 7.5 kilonewton meters. Okay, so what we're going to do as a sanity check is have a look at our fixed end moment formulas and have a look on the sheet of fixed end moment formulas. So, fixed end moment formula for a point load on a completely fixed in beam is PL upon 8. 
And we need to be a little bit careful now that this L isn't the length of the element. This is now the complete length. So this is the complete length of the entire structure. So just be a little bit careful when putting your numbers in there. Lots of letters of the alphabet get re reused and rehashed. So it's something you have to get used to. So 10 times the 6 meter complete length of the structure divided by 8 equals 7.5. So it's a nice quick analytical check that this different method of calculating the system yielded the same answer. So having got our external forces, we're now going to use this matrix way of working to also calculate our internal forces. And in an identical manner to that that we use for bar elements, we use the stiffness matrix just for the element multiplied by the corresponding displacements just for an element to give us the internal forces just for the element. Okay, so, and again, we've got lots of zeros in the system, so it, we could write out the full four by four element stiffness matrix, but we can, in this case, quickly identify which coefficients in the matrix we can multiply out. And so we can quickly write that minus 12 upon L cubed EI multiplied by U2 equals the shear force at node 1 for this element number 1. And we multiply out by the value of U2, and this gets us that S1, let's do 1 for element number 1, equals 5 kilonewtons. And if we scroll back up to our original problem definition, we've got a 10 kilonewton load pointing down, and we've got symmetry of the system, so yes, we'd be expecting a 5 kilonewton load pointing upwards. So we're pretty confident that that's correct without any further calculations. But we're going to go through and use the element stiffness matrix and we can quickly identify that we have a plus 12 upon L cubed EI multiplied by U2 equals the shear force at node 2 of element number 1. And we get now that S element number one, node number two, is equal to minus five kilonewtons. So just as a sanity check, I think we should draw a free body diagram just for element number one. And so we have a shear force five pointing up and a shear force of five pointing down. So that's a positive shear force that this beam is experiencing and it's in vertical equilibrium. Okay, so that was shear forces. We're now going to carry on and calculate the internal bending moments in this beam element. And exactly the same procedure, we use the element stiffness matrix or the coefficients from the element stiffness matrix multiplied by the corresponding displacements for this element only. And we can quickly identify from row number two and take out any of the multiplication by zero elements. We get that minus six EI over L squared multiplied by the now known displacement U2 is equal to the moment at node 1 in element 1 and calculate that out and we get plus 7.5 kilonewton meters and from row 4 we also identify that we have minus 6 E I upon L squared multiplied by U2 
and it also gives us plus 7.5 kilonewton meters. So again, we're going to look at a free body diagram. We're just going to look at the moments. You can prove to yourself that the element is indeed in equilibrium. But just looking at the moments, we have an anti-clockwise rotation on either end. And we can then work backwards using a bit of qualitative analysis to draw our deflected shape. We know we have zero rotation, zero rotation. And it's the... It's the moments at the end that are returning the beam element back to zero rotation when if this was simply supported the beam element would want to displace in such a manner and the rotation at the end of the beam takes it back to zero rotation. Okay, so that's the internal forces calculated. So we've used the direct stiffness element, the direct stiffness method using beam elements just on a very simple 1D example to calculate any unknown displacements, the reaction forces or moments, and the internal forces or moments upon a beam or one element. So what we do want to do as a sanity check is actually use some of the knowledge we already have for a system like this as a double check. So we already hinted towards this earlier. If we have a system with a beam that's fully fixed in subject to a point load P on the center and of length L, different L to the element length, so we need to be careful there. We know that the fixed end moment is equal to PL upon 8. And what we're expecting as a bending moment diagram, in this case, we're going to use superposition. So we're going to be adding the fixed end moment, PL upon 8, to the simply supported moment to get a banding moment like this and we know simple statics that this banding moment is going to be PL upon 4. So the maximum bending moment that we're going to experience at this position then will be M max equals PL upon 4 minus PL upon 8 the fixed end moment gives us PL upon 8 and looking up this value here is the, the 7.5 we calculated it here as an internal moment we got it as 7.5 which was PL upon which is the same as the fixed end moment PL upon 8, so it had the same magnitude of 7.5, and therefore PL upon 8.